Welcome to our time to reconcile. I'm Pastor Tom Pickett. Thank you for joining with us today. The sermon title is Using Our Spiritual Weapons to Fight Our Battles. As you probably are aware, we are living in perilous times. Jesus said that we need to be as wise as a serpent, but as harmless as a dove. In other words, we need to understand the deceptive strategies of our enemy, the devil, and then we need to fight those strategies using the spiritual weapons Jesus has given to us. So let's notice that over in Ephesians 6 today, beginning in verse 10. It's interesting reading through these verses because we see that the first we weapons we have are actually just to help us stand, and they're not used to fight with. And uh, the weapons that Jesus gives to us are not the kind of weapons we would normally think of to fight with because they're spiritual. And that's the most uh, amazing part of studying this today. So in Ephesians 6 and verse 10 it says, Finally be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God. So that's something we have to do every day as it says in Romans 12, 1 and 2. So that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Because the devil is the god of this world. Jesus has allowed him to be that. And he has schemes that he tries to manipulate people on the earth with. Verse 12, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So, what the devil and his uh, demons want to do is to try to influence world events and to control them through people. So we have to be on guard against that and, and to push back. In verse 13, Therefore put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you've done everything, to stand. So it's very important in Jesus' understanding of the battle that we have, that we stand. We're able to actually rise up and stand our, in our position of standing on the rock. Jesus being the rock. So he's given us spiritual armor to put on every day as we begin our day. And he goes through several of these beginning in verse 14. Stand firm then with the belt of truth. And Jesus is our truth. And so we can trust him. And it goes around our waist, so it gives us strength in our midsection of our body as we're standing. With the breastplate of righteousness in place. So Jesus has attributed his righteousness to us. So what we have to do is recognize that every day, be thankful for it, and ask the Lord to help us to walk in that righteousness that he's given to us. In verse 15, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. So he's asked us to take the gospel and take it around the world and to minister to others who have need to be ministered to. So we ought to always be at the ready. Having participated in sports in my life, I realized my coaches were right when they said you had to keep your feet alive, always moving, to keep your balance and to be ready to move. And it all starts with the feet. And so if you're not, you get caught unawares. And especially when you have a message, it depends upon the feet being ready. Well, then it's even more important. So that's what Jesus asks us to do because he's got the message of the gospel he's given to us to share with people around the world. And he wants us to be at the ready. That's a part of our spiritual armor. In verse 16, in addition to all this, take up the shield of faith which he gives us. It's his faith that we have and that we express with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. The evil one is constantly shooting arrows at us that are flaming. He wants to get us irritated and get the best of us, make us feel like there's no hope. And yet, Jesus has given us all the hope that we need. So we use the faith that he's given us to quench those darts, those arrows. And uh, we say, Lord, help me. Sometimes the most simple prayer is the most effective prayer. Lord, please help me. 
And when we then continue with our faith in Jesus, He helps us to see a strategy that we can use to push back, and then those arrows are extinguished. So we then come down to verse 17. And those two verses in 17 and 18 are very important in understanding them to be our weapons in this spiritual warfare that we're in as Christians. So the sword of the Spirit is talked about here in verse 17. It says, Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The Word of God is Jesus. It's Him. It's His thoughts. It's His actions. It's His everything. It's all about who He is. Uh, he was the Word in the Old Testament. Now He's Jesus in the New. And so these words in the Bible are powerful. They come from God Himself. Uh, they're inspired. Uh, the Bible was compiled by uh, Christians back in the third century when they came to a conclusion in Nicaea Conference that this was the Bible that we are to use as the written Word of God. So that's been watered down over time by different forces in the world and, uh, and Satan loves that. <laughs> Because if he can take away the power of our uh, weaponry, see, what is the sword? You know, you you can defend yourself with the sword, and then you can also advance yourself with the sword. So, but how he does that is according to his word. So, if the word is our basis for fighting the good fight, well, then we're going to be doing well. You know, it says over in Hebrews 4, verse 12, if you'll turn there, if you've got your Bible, uh, please join with us. Hebrews 4, and verse 12, it talks about the Word there. Hebrews 4, 12, For the Word of God is alive and active. Is it ever? It is the power of God. And we have it in our hand in this case. But He wants it in our heart. He wants His Word in our heart. So when we speak from our heart, His Word comes out in every situation. It says, sharper than any double-edged sword, it penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. So when we're dealing with people who are having evil intentions toward us, we must use the Word to help us help the person. Not to slay the person, but to help the person. So we, we use the sword, which is the word, you see, to do penetrating even to dividing soul and spirit. We want the word to penetrate and to help the person's thinking change. Uh, it gets down into their soul, in the joints and marrow. It judges their thoughts and attitudes of the heart and then the Word can minister to them. And then God uses us to minister that Word. Understanding what we're really fighting is not the person, it's the evil forces that have influenced the person to think in the way that they're thinking, which is against you, because they make you their enemy. And we say, no, I've got an answer for you. So here it is. So then we ask, you know, always as we prepare for the day, Lord, if I encounter my enemy today, help me to have the Word, Your Word, to express it in Your love to them. Because that's, that's the thing. God is all about love. In fact, He is love. And everything He does, and everything He says is going to be about the love He has for all of us. <coughs> so we find over in... Um, well, let me continue here, because Jesus' words are truth, as it says in John 14, 6, and they are also full of the Spirit and life in John 6, 63. And now over in Ephesians 4, we see a, a powerful expression of the truth which the Word expresses. In Ephesians, uh, the fourth chapter, Talking about the church today, Ephesians 4 and verse 14. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching 
or by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming, which is what it says there in Ephesians, the sixth chapter. So the devil gets a hold of people and they then they resort to uh, deceitful scheming. So the way that the church then deals with that is, as it says in verse 15, instead speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. So the church has gone up and down over time. They're strong at one time and then they get weaker at different times because they stop relying on the word as they should and they stop expressing the word in God's love. Always speaking the truth of that word in love. In every situation, in every circumstance, it doesn't make any difference what's going on because God always loves us and He always wants us to love everybody too. So even though scheming is happening, the way that the church then deals with that, and if the church would truly unify today, we'd be a mighty effective force in expressing the love of Jesus Christ to people who need that so, so much. And it continues here in verse 16. And from Him the whole body, meaning the church, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Each part of the body has its own work to do in regards to the gospel message. So here, it's not done to do something better than the other part of the body. It's done to complement every part of the body. And that's an expression of God's love. You know, the head, Jesus, wants his body to only express his love and to speak the truth in love. So we have an enemy we're dealing with. The only way we can effectively deal with the enemy is to love them. And there are all manner of ways to express the love of Jesus because the Word gives us all kinds of ways of doing that if we read it and understand the application of it. That's why there's so many pages of the Bible. This and that and the other happened and this is God's response to it. So if we really want to know how to speak the truth in love in every circumstance, well we can. We become disciples of the Word. <clears throat> so we want to now look at uh, Matthew. This has always been a favorite example of mine for me personally as well as in preaching. Uh, Matthew uh, 5 and verse uh, 43. Because it gets to the heart of the problem. What do you mean, love our enemy? Well, this is what we're going to find out. You have heard in verse 43 that it was said, I love your neighbor and hate your enemy. And that was uh, the way some people interpreted the Old Testament. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So here we have a, a tremendous tool, not only of God's truth, but of His love, which is in verse 18, which we haven't read yet in Ephesians, the sixth chapter. But here we see how Jesus responds to how we re respond to our enemies. Now you may be children of your Father, in verse 45, in heaven. So that's who we are. In Jesus Christ, we've been reconciled to our Father, and we are His children. So here, here is the way His children respond. He causes His Son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. In verse 46, if you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? Right, so everybody does something to get something. But in Jesus, we give something to give something. <laughs> we don't expect any return except that they're going to be blessed. And if they're blessed, then we're blessed. Now, usually more than that happens. When a blessing occurs, there's something else that happens as well. But you can't look <coughs> forward to counting your chickens before they hatch, right? So you have to just trust in the Lord that Him loving us unconditionally when we were His enemies before we knew Him, actually is paid off for Him today because now we believe in Him 
and we're thankful to Him and we love Him as He loves us. We try to at least. So it's the most effective tool there is in fighting the battle. So if we have an enemy, and I know we do, we all have enemies, people who are against us, this is the thing to do. Because we're His children. And we're the children of our Father, and therefore we're the children of Jesus. And He says this is the way to fight the battle most effectively. In fact, let's go back to uh, Ephesians, the sixth chapter. <clears throat> Ephesians 6 and verse 18. Ephesians 6 and verse 18. And this is the second uh, major weapon we have to fight the battle against our enemies. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. So there are prayers that we can pray just from our own spirit. And those are fine. But when you're in the battle, you need all kinds of prayers that the Spirit can give to you. It's like it says over in Romans, the 8th chapter, and verse 26, it says that even the Spirit intercedes on our behalf when we don't know what to say. But we are imbued with the Holy Spirit of God. We are His children. We are Spirit-minded and Spirit-led. And so we have to give occasion to say, Lord, I've got this situation. Help me to know how to pray. It's like when Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane and He sweat blood because of the pressure that was on Him knowing He was going to the cross to give His life for all of us. You see, He prayed the prayer that God gave to Him to pray. God's good like that. You know, we, we grow in His grace and knowledge. So we always need to understand maybe the prayer that we always rely on in every situation, we're in a different situation now and we can't necessarily pray that prayer again even though it's okay to pray it because we want to be effective in our prayer. So we say, Lord, help me to pray an effective prayer in dealing with this circumstance or this person. Hey, you know the person, they made themselves an enemy of you so you know them pretty well. You know their tactics. You know how they think. You're wanting to pray against that in love for their benefit. <coughs> you want to save them through Jesus to be a child of God too. So we are His ministers of reconciliation. We're the ambassadors of His kingdom on the earth today. And so we have to recognize that through prayer, mountains can be moved if you have the faith. And Jesus has given us the faith. A little bit of faith of Jesus is all we need. Because His faith is sufficient to accomplish all the things that He wants to do in our lives. So, with this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Praying for all the Lord's people. All the people of the Lord have ministry to do. The ministry of reconciliation is one of those ministries. And we must realize that we need help from Jesus Himself to do that ministry. We're all called to be a part of the priesthood of Jesus, the priesthood of Melchizedek. We have responsibilities as members of the body of Christ to do the things that Jesus has in mind for us to do. So in our praying against our enemy, <laughs> and for them, in other words, we're actually praying for them. We also need to be praying for each other because we're all fighting this battle. This is not just singular. You know, God isn't just picking on the believers. <coughs> well, if He can get the members who do the ministry, then He's accomplishing His job. So He doesn't want the members to survive, let alone the pastors or teachers. So we have to realize that this is always an ongoing thing. The devil isn't going to quit until he's put into a bottomless pit after the second coming of Jesus Christ. So we recognize that that is true. One, th one of the things we need as we pray our prayers is wisdom. So over in James, uh, we're told about if we 
are needing wisdom, then to fight the battle at hand, we should go to God. James 1 and verse 2, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. So there you go. <laughs> That's the cherry on top. You know, so you think, oh my, I can, I can hardly stand this. Well, then count it all joy. And that takes that pressure right <coughs> off of you. Did you ever notice that? If someone can come along and make you laugh when you're really under stress, stress leaves like that. That doesn't happen very often because we don't allow it to happen very often if we're under stress. And we say, get out of here and leave me alone. See, because we like the stress, our own stress. <laughs> it's ours. We own it. <laughs> but if someone can possibly sneak in there and surprise us and make us laugh, then we say, oh, thank you so much for taking that stress away. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance in verse 3. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. <coughs> if any of you lacks wisdom, and we all do, every given day we lack wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. That's the gift. He gives us His wisdom whenever we ask Him for it. So when you're having your enemy attack you, that's when we all need wisdom, right? But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. It's called faith, remember? Faith is very important as far as fighting and resisting the devil. So we must not doubt because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. So that's no way to ask for wisdom. We need to ask knowing we're going to receive it. We ask it, he's going to give it to us. In verse 7, that person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. So we ask knowing that the Lord wants to give us His wisdom. So we need it. We've got a battle going on. And He's going to give us the wisdom that we need. So we can pray the effective prayer that we're going to be praying. And I have found in my prayer life, in the course of a day, if, I, if I'm going through a struggle of some kind, uh, my prayer can change dramatically from start to finish. But what I find happens is God directs me in the prayer that I'm praying from start to finish. And I'm coming to a conclusion, a better conclusion, as I go through the day, or days even, so that we can come to the conclusion that God's love is sufficient for all of us in all circumstances. We, here we are, we have a tongue and a mind and wisdom to speak it and we use his word and we pray this word and we we seek God to deliver the person who's our enemy to not be our enemy anymore and to be a child of God instead over in 2nd Corinthians uh, the fifth chapter we we see why Jesus would approach all of this in the way he does because our father with his love sent him to us so he could die on the cross and be resurrected from the dead and we could all be saved and not condemned. And that led to us being reconciled with God and with man. And so we see that God's heart is to reconcile us to bring us into that intimate relationship that we are now in through Jesus Christ. <coughs> So in 2 Corinthians 5 uh, and verse 16, So from now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view. So and we're dealing with, we're dealing with our enemy, you see, what they don't have is a spiritual point of view. What we have is a spiritual point of view. They're coming at us with a worldly point of view, without God as the answer. We're coming to them with the answer of God's love, for God so loved the world, He gave us Jesus, the Father did. So we could be reconciled to our Father in relationship. And therefore, we have a different perspective. And we need to use that as the weapon it is. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, what we're lacking in our world is Jesus' perspective. We have it. Hallelujah! So we need to use it appropriately.
to help people in need. We no longer do the worldly point of view. We do the, only the spiritual point of view. And it's very hard for us because the world's ways are so consuming. And they so have so much pressure on us. We don't realize we have the answer. We have the antidote to that. We need to express it fully. We need to study it. We need to continually pray in our mind whenever it comes up in our mind. Say, Lord, please help. Please help those in need. Let's just please help our president to lead us in the way that we need to be led as a nation. As it says there in 1 Timothy to do. In verse 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation is come. It's, it's here. We are that new creation because we have received what Jesus has given to us. The old is gone, the new is here, and all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave all of us the ministry of reconciliation. So an enemy is someone we're going to minister reconciliation to. Hey, we have a new recruit. Incoming, incoming. See, this person needs the reconciliation of Jesus. Okay, everybody in place, <laughs> which means us, <laughs> since we're the one realizing it. We need to be in place, ready with the gospel message to express <coughs> God's love to this person. We have been uniquely uh, prepared for this. Uh, we've been called of Christ. And Jesus has called us to our Father, given us relationship with our Father, so we can do this, this particular battle, the battle of the Spirit. So He's reconciled us and given us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to Himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. So the enemy who we would say has sin in their lives, we see that Jesus just wants to forgive that person and actually already has. But the person has to come to want to receive that forgiveness of sin. So we can pray that they'll come to that understanding. You know, their burden that they're feeling is sin in their lives. So they can come to the appreciation that if they just went to Jesus with it, He'd take the burden off of them and give them that forgiveness so that they can appreciate the relationship that Jesus has given to all of us. So here we are. We are, we are change, agents of change that God is using to, be, to minister to people who need help, who need to be relieved of their burden. And He has committed to us then the message of reconciliation. Because as it says, we are therefore Christ ambassadors, as though God were making His appeal through us. See, we're praying for them. We're speaking the truth and love to them. We're ministering to their need. We see how much they need Jesus, and we're asking that Jesus fill their heart and mind with His Spirit and truth and His love. We're His ambassadors, as though God were making His appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. We have been given the righteousness of Jesus Christ, so we don't need to worry about whether we are in a right place or not. Jesus has put us in place to be His effective ministers of reconciliation, therefore being His members of His body to speak the truth and love, and that we can effectively use his spiritual weaponry to bless people with, to show them the fullness of God's love so that they can have the full benefits of knowing Jesus just like we do. We thank you, dear Heavenly Father, for giving us Jesus who has given us the truth for his members of his body to fight the good fight. It's a spiritual fight. You're already the victor, but here we're fighting out the last battles of it. And the enemy is angry, and so people are being hurt so much because they don't know you. Help us all to be your ministers of reconciliation, your ambassadors of your kingdom on the earth, that we can speak your truth and love, and that we can pray prayers of love and blessing for other people who need to know you, Jesus. 
We thank you. We ask for your blessing this coming week and your inspiration in our hearts and minds. And it's in your precious and holy name, Jesus, that we pray and ask these things. And all together we say, Amen. Amen.